News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. And a wonderful evening to you. This is Newsline Live. And uh, this evening, broadcasting as we almost do from the News First studios in Dorset Street in Colombo, we have with us the Executive Director of the Centre for Policy Alternatives, uh, Dr. Paki Soti Saraman Mutu. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening. Nice to see you on the programme. Although, um, every time we have you on the program, uh -huh. it's always uh, a matter, there, there are matters of grave uh, consternation and concern, and therefore we roll you out on, in front of our cameras uh, so that we can get your take on it. And that's precisely what we thought we'd do today, this evening. Uh, how grave is the peril uh, that democracy faces in Sri Lanka today? Well, the 20th Amendment, which is now before the Supreme Court, I think is the gravest threat that our democracy has faced in recent times because it plans to roll back whatever checks and balances we got as far as the 19th Amendment was concerned and go back to the 1978 executive presidency. And the point about that was you had all power concentrated in one office and invariably in the person of one man or woman who was elected as president of the country. Now, you know, it's a fundamental tenet of democratic governance that the three arms of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, that no single one of them is so powerful as to lay down the law to the others. Mm -hmm. Here, you have it totally out of sync, and the executive and the executive president is in a position to lay down the law to others. I mean, I think most recently he has said that, you know, what are you talking about? What I say are circulars. You know, so See, there, is, <laughs> there is, you know, it lends itself to an arrogance of power. It also lends itself to a total lack of transparency or accountability as far as governance is concerned. That, that incident where uh, President Nandasena Gautabe Rajapaksa said that, look, well, what are you talking about? I, I'm the president and what I say ought, ought to be considered as um, circulars. Mm. Uh, do you think that was more uh, uh, sort of a, a moment of political flourish than actually, look, this put it down because... Well, he may have been carried away by the surrounding adulation, yeah. etc. But, you know, the famous story of Henry II, rid me of this turbulent priest, mm. and Beckett got it in the cathedral. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, um, okay, but, but honestly, uh, what, as it is, uh, as we all probably will openly acknowledge uh, the election of uh, Rajapaksa to the presidency and then uh, to the prime ministerial role um, would have been um, uh, like a, uh, a red um, flag to a bull uh, in the sense that the international community would immediately uh, start asking and pressing for uh, resolution on accountability uh, claims of, uh, uh, you know, allegations of war crimes and so on. Um, uh, now, on top of all that, you have this apparent uh, concentration of power in in the presidency, or an attempt to do that, uh, and the two thirds which they have. Um, do you think that uh, the international community is going to intensify their uh, their concern? Well, as far as I understand it, the international community is interested in engaging, constructively engaging with this government. And I think in terms of their concerns that came out of the UN Resolution 30 stroke 1, the United Nations Human Rights Council Resolution 30 stroke 1, they will probably bring out those concerns in private, in their discussions with the government, and I think they're probably in a process of trying to decide as to what is going to happen in March next year with regard to the resolution because there is a final debate and is there going to be another resolution? Is Sri Lanka going to remain 
on the agenda of a multilateral institution or are we going to be off the international agenda entirely? You know, so these are, it's a work in progress as it were and after all this government in effect the general election was in August and so we're still what two months or barely two months into a new government. Now um, do you think that um, uh, when uh, our president uh, sort of uh, uh, declares that if international organizations uh, continue insisting on various things that are not acceptable to our government, uh, then they will uh, withdraw f from those organizations. Uh, do you think this sort of um, um, wagging of the finger works or will they, the other side simply withdraw all aid and say, well, on that case, carry on, chaps? You know? Well, I mean, that could happen. But I think the Sri Lankan government is probably emboldened by the Chinese as well as the, the fact of the competition between the Indians and the Chinese as far as Sri Lanka is concerned that therefore it does have a few cards to play with. But let me say this, I mean we can't cherry pick our international obligations etc. We are a member of the international community. We have signed up to certain treaties and covenants and charters and all of that kind of thing. And we need to honor them, you know. Otherwise, we will be some kind of, we could well be the international pariah you talk about, you know. So we, we need to look at this in a much more judicious fashion and ask ourselves, you know, what is the best way to navigate this? This is not a question of sort of sticking your middle finger up and sort of say, telling everyone to go fly a kite. It is about recognizing that we are members of an international community. This is the way the international community operates and we have to learn how to live with that. And uh, isn't that, uh, would you say that all those, uh, the, the, all such interests displayed by the international community uh, will be uh, so much more heightened now that the global uh, economy is down because of COVID and countries like Sri Lanka will, uh, will be uh, very keen to ensure that uh, whatever little trade there is that they must get, get hold of that and of course uh, countries like Britain and, and Europe and so on almost always link uh, any such uh, preferential treatment to a, a robust record of human rights uh, and so on? Well, I mean, we have GSP plus with the European yeah. Union and uh, we are probably going to be eligible for GSP for another three to four years or whatever. And yes, I suppose there is this whole question of the international economy is down, we need to deal with countries in a certain framework and therefore we might have to be tougher. In some cases we may show a certain amount of leeway. All of that I think is a work in progress. I mean we will get a good sense of this if and when we go for an IMF law. We will then get a good sense of what the international community really thinks about us and what it requires, in economic terms, what those conditions may well be. Does it look likely that Sri Lanka will have to go for uh, an IMF? IMF loan? Well, I think it is on the cards. I don't know when it is going to happen, and it may not happen like tomorrow or day after kind of thing, mm. but I think we, we may well have to do that. Do you, um, do you have an issue with the way uh, with the downgrading by, by Fitch of uh, Sri Lanka's Well, writings? I'm not an economist, so I can't go into the technical details of it. But what they are saying is not very different from the, the dire predictions of a lot of people around who are predicting a bad run for the economy. So in that respect, perhaps the timing, but even then, I mean, the point is this, is this has got to be faced at some point, and therefore I don't take a big issue with it. Now, with, with, uh, back to the uh, proposed uh, changes to the Constitution uh, through the 20th Amendment and so on, um, uh, the, what are the chances of uh, actually not going through with uh, most of the proposed changes? 
Well, we have the 20th Amendment as it stands, and all the petitions, 39, a record-breaking number of petitions have been uh, sent to the Supreme Court against it. In the meantime, the government has said that they will make certain changes at a committee stage, right. second reading committee stage. The issue, of course, with regard to that, of course, is that the court has to decide on the basis of fact. Not on what is promised. Not on what is promised, you know. And so <laughs> I hope that the court will hold with us, as I am a petitioner as well, as is the Center for Policy Alternatives. Uh, but let's see. I mean, it's up in the air in the sense of now, I think the court has time till the 12th of October mm. to uh, come up with its decision, whether it requires a referendum or whether the changes that are being proposed can go through without it. How does your organization view uh, the proposal to that the president shall be able to appoint uh, judges and so on? Well, I mean, I think this is totally scandalous. It's totally scandalous because at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're making the judges of this land totally beholden to the executive. And then once they retire, they're probably going to be given diplomatic positions. I mean, which, is, uh, which has been the case in the past. Well, and it's happening now. Mr. Mohan Pires is going as uh, the representative of Sri Lanka to the United Nations, I understand. You know, so the integrity, the, the independence of that arm of government is compromised. And so, therefore, these are, these are pretty serious matters. Oh, yes. It's right down the line. I mean, you see, the point, I think, that needs to be made about the 20th Amendment, it's not about saying this section of it is bad or this section of it should be reformed or whatever. It's bad in toto. Mm -hmm. It's bad because the intention is to pave the way for authoritarianism. Um, what about the need for strong government? To, for, to sort of steam ahead in terms of development and jump-starting the economy and so Well, on. take 1978 when the Constitution was brought in, this Constitution. The argument was that we needed a strong executive presidency for development and the prosperity that it would bring. But we know for a fact we had a civil war in the South, as well as a civil war in the north. We had two upheavals. We know the opportunity costs of the economic development that was going to come, the economic investment that was going to come to this country with the executive presidency. I would think that you have a stronger government where there are checks and balances, where it is accountable, where it is transparent, where it works with the other arms of government. That is what strength is. It's not about one person sitting on top like an almighty monarch mm -hmm. and laying down the law to everyone else, which is what we've got with the 20th Amendment. Let's examine that a little bit more after this short break. Uh, don't go away. After all, this is News 9 Live. We're in conversation with Dr. Paki Soti Sarvodamutu. News First, News Live with Faraz Shaukutali. And welcome back to News 9 Live. We are in conversation with Dr. Parky Sotasarvamuthu, the Executive Director of the Center for Policy Alternatives. Uh, Dr. Sarvamuthu, we've got a question from a viewer. Thank you very much, by the way. 0772-300-305 by SMS only. Can Sri Lanka pull out from the UN um, and all the HRs, the Human Rights Commission? Uh, following uh, the example set by the United States, if so, uh, what would the consequences be for Sri Lanka? Well, I mean, yes, Sri Lanka can say that it is not going to participate fully in the activities of the Human Rights Council. Um, that does not necessarily mean that the other countries, like the core group on Sri Lanka that have brought resolutions and all of that, are going to ignore Sri Lanka. You know, so mm -hmm. I think, you know, Sri Lanka taking that decision, if it is not going to be founded on a lack of interest or a sort of relatively mild attitude towards Sri Lanka, I don't think that's really necessarily going to be possible. 
because you know we are a country that is always engaged in international politics we've never stood out we were a leading member of the non-aligned movement all of that kind of thing so it would be very odd for us to stand out and let the chinese and the indians look after us internationally but what of what about um, serving the people's needs um, now in the last government uh, we the minister of housing um, wanted to build 125,000 houses. Uh, I believe that the, the figure we need in terms of housing is around that amount. Uh, the former government tried to build 65,000 homes in the north. That came down, I think they managed one, uh, which is a show house. And for whatever reason, the, the people who are in need have simply been forgotten or laid by the side. Uh, whilst all these nice things are being argued and debated and so on. But honestly, nine out of ten people, I venture to suggest, don't really care about this. The, the people who need housing, the people who need facilities and opportunities and schools and so on. Um, how is the government going to cope with all that? Well, I mean, yes. There are a majority of people in this country who are ne not necessarily obsessed or taken up with that whole notion of transitional justice and uh, the disappeared and all of that kind mm. of thing. But we cannot deny that there are people in this country who are. They are also citizens of Sri Lanka. And if they are to be treated as equal citizens of this country as they should be, their concerns, their grievances should be taken into account. Now, the question with regard to transitional justice, the resolution 30 stroke one set up, we set up the Office of Missing Persons. We've also set up an Office of Reparations. There are two other mechanisms that we promised to set up which we have not. One is, of course, the Truth and Justice and Reconciliation Commission, and the other is the accountability mechanism. And there was this whole debate about the question of whether there would be foreign judges or not with mm. regard to it. Now, the government needs to have a policy. There needs to be a response. Okay, if you do not want the international community to get involved in it, what are you doing? What is this government ready to do for reconciliation? Does it say that, look, reconciliation is going to come through economic development? And if it is economic development, how about starting with land that is still in the possession of the forces? Although even in the last government, um, we had uh, uh, the members of that government, including defense secretaries and so on, state that... Um, there were some lands that they would simply not release because they were needed Fine. for security reasons. Okay, so there is some land that is going to remain in government hands. What about the rest of it? You know, what is the program with regard to housing in the north and east? What is the situation with regard to the what forty to fifty thousand mothers who are single women heading households now? You know. What, what is the situation with regard to them? You know, so there are a number of things which economic development in itself will not solve. It's not a question of putting money in people's pockets. I mean, there is much more to it as well. You know, so what we need is a holistic policy from our government which says that, yes, we will prioritize economic development. However, there are some issues from the past that we have to deal with, and yes, we will also deal with those. But as far as a government is concerned, and as far as the platform on which we are elected, we are going to prioritize economic development. I'm going to ask you this question because it then leads to something else. Do you think that, quite frankly, that uh, Sri Lanka is living in a uh, with a government that is racist or communal minded? Well, I think that we are, we have at the present moment a government that is very concerned 
and very keen on asserting, sometimes aggressively, the majority identity, that is, the singular Buddhist identity. And therefore, whether it is by choice, whether they do it deliberately or not, everyone who is not of that identity gets put into a secondary position at best. So if you are asking me the question, does that amount to a racism, does that amount to a certain discrimination? Yes, I think it does. Yes, I think it does. I mean, look at this. The whole point with regard to accountability was the point about international judges. Take Sunil Ratnayak. He has been convicted by every single court in this country yeah. of the murder of eight civilians. Is it eight or eleven? I can't remember. Of which there were children, yeah. one of whom was five years old. Yeah. The president pardons him. Why? Why do you pardon someone? This is the Sri Lankan judicial system that has convicted this man right up to the Supreme Court. And you pardon him? But the president does retain the right. He to has the right to pardon, but what are the grounds on which he's pardoning this particular person? Can he, can he rely on humanitarian needs? Humanitarian needs? When every single court in this country has convicted this man? Forgiveness is part of uh, uh, the, uh, the religion of the majority. In fact, the religion of all religions. Well, yes, there are other cases. Yeah. So in that case, we should not be convicting anyone. We well, should, say, should, we should say that our religions, all our religions, preach forgiveness. And therefore, as the chief executive of the country, we should, no we should exercise this provision of the Constitution. Or that we should take away the, the right to pardon from the president and perhaps place it within some uh, multi-party committee. Perhaps. Perhaps. What chances of real reconciliation in the next, within the next five years? Well, let's put it like this. I think if the government's economic programs are successful and that there is demonstrable improvements in terms of economic development, you will begin to get some notion of reconciliation and the sense of grievances and all of that might fade somewhere and recede somewhat into the past. But if that's not the case, they will be there and they will be canvassed as purposefully as they have in the past. You know, this country is not going to succeed until we face each other and admit that we have allowed nasty things to happen to each other. Either by design, design or by omission. Either by design or omission. That is why we talk, they talk about a truth commission. What about the Office of uh, Missing Persons? Well, the Office of Missing Persons, yes. Uh, they are continuing with their work. One hopes that they are not starved of funds. Because if that was to happen, then the real work that they can do will not happen. So it, none of these mechanisms can function in the way that they're supposed to unless the political commitment is there to ensure that they function in the way that they're supposed to. Well, Dr. Pakisoti Saramana, thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you. Sharing your concerns, uh, as uh, we all do in our country. Uh, and uh, let's just hope for equity and uh, uh, real democracy. But in the meantime, we mustn't forget that our leopards are being snared and killed. Uh, the uh, uh, sea erosion is taking place all over the place. Uh, the Norwich-Early power station continues to pollute and uh, we are all wondering what on earth is happening to our environment. The constitution can be fixed every 5, 10, 15 or 20 years, but can the environment? Let's talk about that perhaps in the coming week. Take care, have a great night and God bless you.